Council es una organización sin fines de lucro con una misión uh, de ayudar a la comunidad de Oakland por 55 años. Nuestros programas y servicios ayudan a más de 12 mil personas en la comunidad en cinco idiomas. Hoy estamos muy felices para darle la bienvenida al gobernador Kevin Newsom, que va a estar aquí para dar un anuncio sobre el paquete del símbolos. Este símbolo llega en un momento muy crítico para las comunidades que han seguido trabajando durante esta pandemia. Los trabajadores esenciales necesitan este apoyo ahora y sobre mente, uh, para, especialmente para uh, poder sobrevivir los efectos que van a durar muchos años uh, después de esta pandemia. Y ahora me da mucho gusto uh, darle la bienvenida a Chris Iglesias, que es nuestro CEO del Unity Council. Gracias, Kareli. Buenos días, everyone. My name is uh, Chris Iglesias. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Unity Council. Thank you for those open remarks. Um, it was important that Kareli started uh, just so you know, 70% of our staff here at the Unity Council are women, and as they always remind me, jefe, the future is Latina, so you just gotta, you just gotta look at the future right there, and we're, we're in good hands. Um, I want to welcome everybody here today, and I'm, I'm really excited that Governor Newsom and his team have made their way to the fruit fail. I've been inviting him here for the past eight years. He's, he's, I just haven't been able to get him here, but the fact that he came today is is it sends a loud message to the community. It sends a loud message to the communities around the state that are similar to Fruitvale, that are similar to East Oakland, that have taken a, the brunt of this pandemic. So the fact that he's here and his team is here, that shows that they recognize, they know that this is the land of essential workers. This is the land, this is the place where we never left our post. We worked the entire time. We put ourselves out there so everybody else could stay home on Zoom and get their food delivered to them and their wine and whatever else. And I think this message that sh basically shows that, we're, that they're here, that they have ideas, they have funding, and we're not going to leave anybody behind during this pandemic because we're still in it. I know it may not look like it, it may not feel like it, but many of us, many of the organizations in the fruit field are still dealing in the basics. We're still feeding people. We're still providing rent relief. I mean, it's, it's still happening right now. So yes, we need that recovery. And I know we're going to hear some exciting things about that today. But it, I think the, the fact that the governor and his team came to the Fruitvale to acknowledge what, what has happened, how difficult this year is, speaks volume. And we're, very, and we're honored to host him today. So with that, I'd like to introduce the uh, mayor of Oakland, or as we call her, the baller of Oakland, the fighter of justice for immigrants, Mayor Libby Schaaf. Here you go. Oh, I love that introduction, Chris. Thank you so much. Gracias a Unity Council. Mi nombre es Libby Schaaf. Soy la alcaldesa de esta ciudad bonita, Oakland, California. I'm the mayor of Oakland, such a beautiful city and very proud to be hosting our governor today. We join this governor in lifting up a just recovery. Oakland is a city that has been hit hard by this pandemic. And you are going to hear today about an unprecedented moment where government is coming to the aid of those who need it most. And let us start by thinking of our families, our families who have suffered so much economically, emotionally over this past year. I commend Governor Gavin Newsom for taking an unprecedented state surplus and aid from the federal government and investing it directly in the people of California. Direct aid to people is what is going to get our economy roaring back. And Oakland is uh, an, uh, going to benefit from this tremendously. I love saying that Oakland, California, is someone standing in the doorway or? <laughs> okay.
All right, I'll just keep going. <laughs> I love saying Oakland, California is the most unapologetic sanctuary city in America. And I also commend Governor Gavin Newsom for recognizing that our immigrant workers who do not qualify for much federal aid will be taken care of by the state of California. Now, for much of the aid that is available in this unprecedented state budget, you must file your taxes. Tienen que hacer tus impuestos este año. En este año es más importante que otros años, porque hay dinero que es gratuita para familias, incluso familias que son inmigrantes sin social security, con un ITIN. Hay más dinero para estas familias. Por favor, Venga para ayuda en la ciudad de Oakland para preparar tus impuestos. Please take advantage of free assistance to file your taxes. Taxes are due one week from today. And if you need help, free help to file your taxes so you can enjoy some of the Golden State stimulus, please call 211. Por favor, llame 211 para ayudar a preparar tus impuestos este año es más importante que otros años. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Assembly's Budget Committee, someone who is going to be a partner in creating one of the greatest California budgets we have ever seen, and that is Assembly Member Phil Ting. Assembly Member. Thank you, Mayor Schaff. It's so great to be in Oakland. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at the Unity Council. I think the first time I set foot in here was when I was um, taking a city planning class at UC Berkeley, and one of our projects was trying to envision uh, and really take feedback as to what the community uh, would want it, and seeing so many of the projects that they were talking about over 30 years ago, that transit village, the access to the BART station, see those become a reality because of this amazing organization. I just want to commend Chris and your whole team for all the amazing work that you've done. Um, I think Mayor Schaff said it extraordinarily well. Uh, we know that COVID has been a very challenging year for every Californian and every American. Uh, it has touched every single person's life and frankly changed all our lives. And at the same time, uh, for many people before COVID, uh, they were struggling. They were living paycheck to paycheck. They were one paycheck away from being homeless. Uh, many of them were homeless. Many people were trying to figure out how they could survive. And frankly, COVID has made their life worse. And we acknowledge that. And this is the budget where we are looking to try to figure out how we can uplift their lives, how we can take folks who are working Californians, people who, as Chris talked about, never stopped working, uh, kept working in the restaurants, kept working at the pharmacies, they kept working at the grocery stores, uh, had high infection rates of COVID. We know so many of those communities really need our help. And at a time when people need government the most, often we're in a situation where we can't help them. But, and the governor's gonna talk about this, but because of our progressive tax policy, we rely on those Californians who have the most. And that very small segment of California has done incredibly well, has done incredibly well this last year. And because of that, we have an unprecedented budget surplus. And that budget surplus is going right back to the most vulnerable Californians, the ones who need the help the most, the ones who need help with housing, whether it's making your rent payments, the ones who need help with food, the ones who are making, want to make sure that our schools are open up in the fall, the ones who are worried about health care and making sure that they can cover those costs. That is what this budget is about. This is an opportunity to build the California, not of next year, but really of the next hundred years. 
And so much of the foundation, as someone who's born and raised in this incredible state and has really, uh, and as a child of immigrants, really benefited from all the infrastructure that was built before my family even got here. Uh, that's what we're trying to lay down in this budget. We know we have a historic opportunity. You're going to hear about the money that is going to go back into people's pockets today. But over the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing about the foundation that we're going to lay for this great state in terms of our education system, in terms of our health care system, in terms of much of our social safety net that was decimated in the last recession. And that is what I'm so excited about and really being able to deliver on that California promise for so many. Because I know there are folks who are working class folks who wondered if that promise is still alive. And I'm, and I'm here to tell you, I know we are all here to tell you, that promise is well alive and we're going to be doubling down on that promise in this budget. So thank you. I, I'm so proud to um, introduce my colleague uh, whose district we're in, uh, State Senator Nancy Skinner. She is the budget chair for the State Senate and has been a great partner in working to develop this year's budget. Nancy Skinner. Gracias, uh, Assemblymember Ting. Gracias, Jefe Iglesias. Gracias, Mayor. Um, soy Nancy Skinner, Senatore de Distrito Nueve, aquí, Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, and y todo. Más, más comunidades. Um, I'm really glad to be here and to be able to thank the Unity Council for the incredible work that it does in providing support to our Fruitvale community and to other residents of Oakland in the East Bay. Support in filing taxes and then being able to access the incredible resources that both the federal government and the state of California have made available, which if folks don't file their taxes, they aren't able to access. And so the Unity Center is here to provide that. As the mayor said, llame 211 para ayudar in the filing of the taxes. And especially come here to the Unity Council and you will get that help. Now, we're going to hear from Governor Newsom in just a moment, who's going to talk about some great things that as my colleague mentioned, the chair of the uh, Assembly Budget Committee, that because of California's very progressive tax structure and because most of our revenue becomes, comes from the wealthiest, we're talking top 1% wealth in this state, is what provides much of the revenue, plus capital gains from the high, high stock market. But so we have money. Now, unlike other states, we are using that money to support the many Californians who've been hurt during this pandemic. And we have already given out our first Golden State stimulus. And so our I-10 filers, our low-income essential workers, so many more already got $600 checks from California. That's on top of whatever they may have gotten from the federal government. And unfortunately, many of those folks, especially our I-10 filers, did not get anything from the federal government. But we are in the position now to be able to provide more. And I'm not going to steal the governor's thunder. He will give you the details. But I'm just very proud that we are a state that reflects the type of values that recognizes that so many people were disproportionately hurt by this pandemic. They were disproportionately hurt economically. They were disproportionately hurt by the disease. They had families, they had family members who died at much higher rates than those folks like myself who got to stay home and work from home and work by Zoom. I didn't get to stay home the whole time. But anyway, who did not have to do the essential work of delivering all the goods that those of us at home so we could avoid going to the store, or the essential work of cleaning the facility so none of us would have the exposure to COVID. All of that was done by essential workers 
who continued to receive less wages than, and it's the usual disproportionate fact of our economy. But we are doing our best to fix that. And then let me just say a couple more things before I introduce the governor. With our governor's leadership, we are now amongst the top two states with the lowest rate of COVID. We are also in the top states in terms of vaccination rate. We are safer than ever. And we are roaring back. And we are trying and doing our best to roar back in an equitable way so that this disproportionate economic inequity that exists in this state and this disproportionate impact of COVID on our residents that we can do our best to counter it. And with that, let me introduce the great governor of the state of California, Gavin Newsom. Thank you, Senator. And thank you all very much for the privilege and opportunity to be here. Really, thank you very much for opening up uh, your home of sorts. And Chris, uh, honored to finally be here with you. And to the mayor, um, I'll brag on Mayor Schaff in a moment. It's a pleasure to be back with you here. Uh, and, of course, with our two chairs, uh, respective budget committees uh, in the Senate and the Assembly, I want to just acknowledge and thank uh, Assemblymember Ting and Senator Skinner for their incredible leadership, stewardship, support uh, over the course of the last number of years, but more importantly, over the course of the last number of months, as this state has been very deliberative, very intentional uh, in moving very focused way to address some of the most systemic and challenging issues in this state, not waiting for traditional calendars to provide that direct relief and support across a spectrum of issues. Uh, that sense of urgency has been demonstrable. This partnership with the Assembly and the Senate uh, has been second to none, and I'm incredibly grateful to both of you for your incredible leadership. Um, I'm about to make an announcement no other governor in California history has ever made, and I would argue no governor in American history has ever made. Uh, today, we're announcing a $75.7 billion budget surplus. I'll repeat that, because uh, only three people apparently heard it. Uh, this time last year, we announced a $54.3 billion projected shortfall. Today, we are announcing a projected $75.7 billion budget surplus. It's a remarkable turnaround. We talked about California coming back. I made the point at the State of the State a number of months ago, California is not coming back. California is going to come roaring back. $75.7 billion operating budget surplus. An additional $26 billion will be coming from the federal government. We are now in a position to roll out a hundred-plus billion dollar comeback plan in the State of California. And the first announcement in that plan we're announcing today, and that's immediate relief to millions and millions of taxpayers, millions and millions of Californians. Today, we're announcing $12 billion tax rebate to the people of the state of California, earning up to $75,000. Let me put that in perspective. That tax rebate will impact just shy of 80 percent of all tax filers will get a direct stimulus check, will get a direct relief payment because of this announcement. Two-thirds of all Californians will benefit from this stimulus. That's roughly $12 billion, let me be specific, $11.9 billion when you add, as Senator Skinner said, to the stimulus, the round one stimulus that we put out a number of months ago. I want to make this clear, and I make this with respect that is due. This is a proposal from the administration. It requires concurrence and support of the legislature, and that's why it's humbling and very meaningful to have the two budget chairs here today. I'm by no means naive about the deliberative process as we roll out uh, not only today's announcement, but we roll out this May revise on Friday of the importance of that give and take with the legislature. But I'm mindful that our values are aligned and that's been demonstrable over the course of the last number of months with the early action that we've taken. So $12 billion in direct tax rebate. That's the largest year-over-year -over -year tax rebate that's ever been provided in any state in American history. Number two, we're very mindful 
that, that stimulus alone of $600, $500 for families with children and those I-10 filers uh, is not enough to address the stress, the anxiety over the course of the last year plus in this pandemic-induced recession. And that's why today we'll be announcing our desire, our plan to double the rental assistance in the state of California with the goal of getting 100% of all the back rent paid and provide 100% support over the next few months to renters that have been directly impacted by this pandemic. $5.2 billion we're putting up to take care of rent payments. In addition to the $5.2 billion, this builds on the 2.6 we announced a number of months ago, additional 2.6, $5.2 billion, in addition to paying off 100% of that rent going back to last April and moving forward over the course of the next number of months. We're also mindful rent is just one part of the burden of households. Issues of gas, electricity, and water are real. So today we're announcing $2 billion of direct relief to pay down utility expenses, to pay off water, gas, and electricity needs. One billion, one billion of that $2 billion specifically we're proposing to be set aside to address the issue of water in this state. So this is not an insignificant announcement. It's unprecedented, as I say, in California history, but that's rhetoric, and that often gets lost. But direct stimulus checks going into people's pockets, that direct relief, that's meaningful. Direct renter relief at 100%, not the 80%, is our proposal, and we would allow for that 100% to be retroactive to cover those that have already received the 80% assistance and providing $2 billion for gas and electricity and for water, we think uh, is a significant direct, not only stimulus, but direct relief to millions and millions of Californians in need. And this is just the first of many announcements this week across the spectrum that amplify the narrative of this state truly roaring back. I want to just close, make a few subsequent points to what the Senator was referring to a moment ago as well. This is all on the basis of the recovery that California is already experiencing. It's on the basis of the revenue that's coming in in historic terms in the state of California. And that's because we are defeating and we are successfully applying strategies to address this pandemic. And as Senator Skinner rightfully said, our case rate and our positivity rate are among the lowest in the United States of America. In fact, today, the seven-day rate came in at just 1.0 percent. That's the lowest seven-day case rate, or rather positivity rate, since the beginning of this pandemic. And, and put that in perspective, some have suggested, well, we're not testing like we did. That's not necessarily the case. 223,000 tests came in yesterday, 1,337 individuals tested positive for COVID. Accordingly, the Senator was right, California continues to make progress on vaccinations. Just shy of 32.5 million doses have been administered to Californians, just shy of 62 percent of all Californians have received at least one dose, eligible Californians 16 and over. This week, we will request from the federal government 100 percent of the available supply that's been set aside for the state of California, 2,076,000 doses to be exact. And while there has been a decline in people that have looked to access the vaccine, it's not as precipitous as many other states, but we are mindful it's a decline nonetheless. And I reinforce this in closing before we open it up to questions to make this point. One has to do with the other. That California's economic success, our economic recovery is predicated on ending this pandemic. And we need to be mindful that this disease is not taking, didn't take Mother's Day off and it's not taking um, the summer off. It's as deadly as it's ever been. And we are mindful that the mutations 
are as challenging as they've ever been. We are monitoring well over uh, a, well, just shy of a dozen mutations in this state. And that's why it's important to remind each and every one of you the power and potency. Uh, if we want to get our kids safely back into in-person instruction to get our small businesses back up and operational, if we want this economic recovery to continue as robustly as it's began, uh, we need to continue our vaccine program. We need to continue to be vigilant and mindful of mask wearing and social distancing until this disease is behind us once and for all. 275,000 jobs have been created in the last two months. Uh, in the state of California. 41% of America's jobs came out of the state of California in February. California is not just back, California is roaring back. And I want to thank every member, this remarkable place we call home, every member of our extraordinary community, 40 million Californians strong, for everything you've endured, for your resilience, for your grit, for your determination and for your commitment, not only to yourselves and your loved ones, but the broader community, because everything we just announced is because of the people of the state of California, their hard work, and that's demonstrable in the announcement that we're making here today. So with that, we're here, of course, to take any questions. Hey, Governor, Jeremy with Politico. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I'm gonna do every other reporter's favorite thing and ask you a two-part question. Uh, so first piece is uh, there's no shortage of proposals for Democrats in the legislature for ways to spend this windfall, everything from uh, more coverage for undocumented immigrants to more wildfire preparedness. So why open with this proposal of direct payments? And then um, as you well know, some statutory language having to do with distance learning is up for either renewal or expiration soon. Do you support uh, continuing the allowance for distance learning next year, or do you think it's time to move on? Uh, on June 30th at midnight, I anticipate uh, that that will lapse, and everybody should be back in the fall and in-person instruction safely. In fact, our budget will reflect even more support than the previous support that has been provided for health and safety, and I look forward to working closely and collaboratively with the legislature to advance those budget proposals as well. As I noted just a moment ago, this is one of a series of announcements we'll be making this week. We're honored and pleased to be here uh, in the backyard of the two uh, budget chairs to make this important announcement of direct relief uh, and this large tax rebate, the largest in U.S. history year over year, because we believe people are better suited than we are to make determinations for themselves of how best to use uh, these dollars. And that's why we want to get money into people's pockets as quickly as possible, and we want folks to know uh, that this, uh, these resources are coming. Accordingly, we recognize the acuity of stress associated uh, with back rent, and we recognize the acuity of stress as it relates to gas, water, and electric bills. And we think it's really important to send a powerful message today about the importance of being able uh, to find relief and access these critical funds so we can keep people housed, we can keep people warm, safe, uh, and make sure that they're getting uh, the kind of resources that they deserve during this very challenging period of time. You'll be hearing uh, other announcements today, later this afternoon, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and May Revise will be formally presented uh, for consideration in the legislature on Friday. Uh, hey, Governor, it's Ben Christopher from CalMatters. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to do this. Uh, I'm going to copy Jeremy and do a two-parter. Um, first, just This is what is known in, you know, in legal terms, collusion. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, no comment on that. So uh, the first round of stimulus checks, we saw a number of people, a large population of people who were eligible but maybe didn't uh, receive that benefit. So I'm wondering what you learned from that process the first time around that you're going to incorporate into this one to make sure that as many people as possible who are eligible are getting that relief. And then the second question is just about the GAN limit. Is that what is guiding this allocation? Is this all coming out of the GAN limit requirement? And if so, is there any um, are you allowed to sort of target that the, the allocation, or, or does it have to be per capita equally? Yeah, we, we, we talked about the GAN limit in January um, and the budget presentation. It's likely we'll hit the GAN limit for only a second time since 1979, uh, and that will be determined over the course of the next year, year plus, uh, where exactly 
uh, what exact amount of dollars uh, will be needed to set aside. 99.9% .9 of you have no idea what the GAN limit is. Suffice it to say, it triggers when there's a windfall of revenue, a requirement that roughly half money uh, that is stipulated in that requirement go to K-12 through 12 education under our Prop 98 formula, and another half go back in some form of direct uh, support to the taxpayers. This is uh, above and beyond the statutory requirement. This is not the reason we're moving forward with this announcement. We're building on the announcement of a number of months ago. And the segue to your question, the first part of your question, is what did we learn? We learned that those just filing EITC, those earning up to $30,000, while that was important, it's also important to recognize that we needed to provide direct relief for people in the middle class, people earning up to $75,000. And that's why we're announcing and enhancing uh, the available funds for those individuals. And again, that represents 78, almost 80% of all tax filers in the state of California. The middle class have been hurt hard by this pandemic. Uh, they've been squeezed across the spectrum. Uh, working moms, in particular women, notably, have been disproportionately impacted in this pandemic, and that's why we are building on what we did in January, providing additional $500 to support families with children. So the eligibility is now north of $1,100, or roughly $1,100, not just the $600 check. That's an additional $500. And we recognize the importance of continuing to make sure we're there for all Californians, because at the end of the day, one thing we know, and it was referenced uh, by the comments were made earlier, is there was one group of residents in this state uh, that did not dial home sick and weren't able to do a lot of as much distance uh, work as others. And those were our central workers, our frontline employees, uh, many of them in mixed status families, many of them without documentation. And they were left out of the federal supports. They will not be left out of the support coming from the state. Hi, Governor. Alexi Costa from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I'm going to make this a trend and also ask a two-part question. Um, the first would be, could you clarify? There's a lot of different pots of money. Could you clarify a little bit about what is going to be paying for these different proposals that you have announced today? And then the second would be that, you know, you're, th this is a kickoff for, it sounds like, a week of events that you're going to be doing to promote this this budget that you don't plan to fully announce until Friday um, is I mean is this a campaign strategy as you're facing this recall election to get you know as much bang for your buck as possible good publicity about you know these overflowing budget numbers. I'm really proud of California's resilience. I'm incredibly proud of California's uh, remarkable capacity not only to come back but to come roaring back. I was also proud to. Uh, now have had the opportunity, this is my third budget, to do what I did last year and do what I did the year before, and that's preview and highlight critical investments in the budget. And this is uh, something that I've looked forward to do, something we did uh, in January, something we did uh, last year in January and in the May revise and the year prior. And so uh, that is an important part of a budget process. It's one of the reasons, and I was very proud and very grateful uh, to review in detail the work that the Senate did and the Assembly did with their blueprint, uh, and they previewed their priorities as well, and so many of them align uh, remarkably well. And so uh, that, that's why we're here. On the issue of the resources, uh, it is true, $75.7 .7 billion is general fund surplus. Uh, you have a portion of that will go to K through 14 education under Prop 98, a portion of that will be set aside under Prop 2 uh, to pay down long-term obligations, unfunded health care, as well as pension obligations. We'll increase our rainy day reserve. That's about $11.2 billion, 26.6 under the Prop 98, 38.1. And if you're following me, uh, I'm impressed, but 38.1 uh, will be set aside uh, for programs like those I just announced. There's an additional $26.6 billion. That's why it's over $100 billion dollar comeback plan that comes from the federal government. Those have stipulated requirements, and those requirements include the inability to do what perhaps uh, we, uh, well, not perhaps, likely the inability to do what we just announced, and that's a direct tax rebate. This direct tax rebate does not come out, to your question, of the $26.6 billion federal 
uh, stimulus, this direct tax rebate, the largest in U.S. history, not just California history year over year, uh, will come out of the operating uh, reserve, or rather, excuse me, the operating surplus if approved by the legislature. Hi, good morning, Governor. Uh, Melissa Colorado with NBC Bay Area News. Do you have a rough estimate as to how much money California tenants owe to their landlords during the pandemic? And my other question is, will cities and counties be allowed to set their own eviction moratoriums? Will it change from county to county, city to city? Yeah, so we have a statewide overlay and we have language as relates to the authority for local government. Uh, that's due to expire in a number of months. We'll work with the legislature uh, through a very deliberative process, similar to the two processes that we advanced prior uh, to make any subsequent terminations on the basis of your question. Um, as it relates to uh, these broader issues, um, and forgive me, the first part of your question was specific to the rent. That, that issue, interestingly, there are a number of different studies that have come out with estimates. Uh, some on the low end, uh, well below the 2.6 billion, some on the high end, uh, north of the 5.2 that we just put out. So the answer to the question is, there is no readily reliable information that we can determine with some confidence what that universe looks like. And that's why we are increasing the total numbers available on the higher end just to make sure we're covering uh, the worst case scenario. And we believe roughly within margin that 5.2 should do it. That said, the take up on the first 2.6 billion has been a little slower than some had anticipated, which may preview that the universe may not indeed be as large uh, as that high end number. So we, we just are in abundance of caution, making sure we cover uh, a worst case scenario but we'll be mindful in the deliberative process working with the legislature to assess and make a, uh, a determination over the course of the next number of weeks before this budget lands. Good morning, Governor. Matt Boone with KCBS News Radio. Thanks for taking my question. Um, trying to get people back to work um, would also be aided by reducing the restrictions that have been imposed because of the pandemic. You set the target for June 15th for the dissolution of the tier system. Are we still on track for that? And if so, would it happen any earlier if things are looking pretty good? Well, as long as we continue to keep this vaccination rate going, 333,000 people uh, received a dose in the last reporting period over the last 24 hours, a little over 2 million in the last seven day period. As I noted, that's down uh, from where we were a number of weeks ago. So we're mindful that as long as the vaccination rate uh, continues around pace we've seen, at least the minimum pace we've seen over the last uh, week or so, uh, then we're confident that June 15th number. We're also very pleased uh, that we've seen case rates and positivity rates as low as they've been for a number of weeks, not just days, not just episodic, but a number of weeks. That stabilization is very encouraging. Uh, as you know well, San Francisco was the first a Bay Area city that moved into yellow tiered status, the least restric restricted tier. The vast majority of counties are now uh, out of the purple and red status in the orange uh, and yellow status, which means uh, in uh, the least restrictive tiers. And we're looking forward in the next number of weeks to uh, go beyond the blueprint. And we are confident we'll get it done uh, at least by June 15th. That's it. Well, that was it. I, that, that's what happens when you have two-part questions. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just thank again, always a mayor, once a mayor, always a mayor. So thank the mayor, uh, Mayor Schaaf, for all her incredible leadership and support and, um, and, uh, and, and, and guidance as it relates to budget allocations. And, uh, and trust me, she hasn't been shy about uh, what she hopes to see in terms of investments uh, here in Oakland. Uh, throughout the county. Again, it's uh, humbling to be here with the two budget chairs who've been just incredible leaders. Uh, and we look forward to uh, the give and take of the budget process. Uh, this week, we're rolling out our plan, building on the plans that they put out. Uh, and we look forward to sitting down, rolling up our sleeves, and working through the details uh, with both of them and their staffs, and moreover, with the entire legislature over the next few weeks. But grateful opportunity to be here. Chris, great to be back with you and notably great to be here at Unit K.
Council. Thank you.